Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Eric Townell. My guest today is Deborah Fox, Artistic Director of Pegasus Early Music and a performing lutenist. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you Thank so much you. for coming in. Happy to be, to be here. Yeah, I'm glad that you're here. So now, uh, you direct Pegasus Early Music, mm -hmm. which is an ensemble of professional performers doing what kind of music? So uh, we do music, we call it early music, oh. um, but in fact, our repertoire extends from the 12th century up to Brahms. Oh. So it's quite um, uh, a huge span of time and not really what one would think of as early music, which in the old days used to mean anything before Bach, oh. before 1750. But it's actually expanded in the last couple of decades. Mm, mm -hmm. What early music is, is um, more of a way of approaching music. I see. Uh, it's taking a look at the actual instruments that were used at the time that the music was composed, mm -hmm. which are very different from what you hear today in a symphony orchestra. And using those instruments and also studying the treatises of the time, um, reading about performances of the time, mm -hmm. to try to replicate or try to understand the music from the perspective of the time, oh, rather than putting our 21st century ideas about music onto the music mm -hmm. um, from the 14th century, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, I play the lute, which is not really a modern instrument mm. at all. So that's, I had to learn about what the technique was, mm -hmm. what the string, what kind of strings to use. Oh, I see. It's a plucked string instrument. It's a instrument. plucked string instrument, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like the guitar, but it's not the guitar. Oh, so it's uh -huh. very different. Uh -huh. um, the strings are made out of gut. The uh -huh. technique that you pluck with is a little bit different. Actual gut. Actual gut. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, Usually these days, beef gut. Um, <laughs> you can't be a vegetarian, although there are some very good um, synthetic strings oh, I now. I see. Uh -huh. uh, in those days, probably um, sheep gut or whatever they could find. Oh, I see. Um, and same with violins, used gut strings. The bow was differently shaped uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, in the Baroque period uh -huh. than it is now. Oh, I see. Um, the instruments weren't made for very big concert halls oh, the way uh -huh. they are now. They right. weren't made to project because concert or places where music was played were generally in much smaller chambers. More intimate settings. Yes, more intimate settings. Mm -hmm. um, the style of singing was quite different. Uh -huh. um, and even, for example, in the 19th century with Brahms, the pianos were very different from a modern Steinway. Uh, so we look at all that uh -huh. and we play. And to me, it's a more um, intimate experience I see. for music, um, as well as the way of thinking about the music. In the 17th and 18th century, for example, there was a lot of improvisation, uh -huh. which most um, symphony players are not, it's not part of our training uh, yes. now in I the see. 21st century. So uh, we learn how to improvise in the style of that time, ah. in the language or the country. Um, so there's a so musicological aspect yes, to Yes, very book. much I so. I see. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of research that goes uh -huh. into it, but um, it's very fun to play. And I think um, for the audiences, it's fun because there's always a spontaneity and a sense of improvisation oh, about delightful. the music. Mm -hmm. so, so you mentioned the lute and the violin. What other instruments are people likely to hear in the Pegasus Early Music Ensemble? Uh -huh. um, the harpsichord, of uh -huh. course, cello, mm -hmm. viola da gamba, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, wind instruments, the uh -huh. early flute, early oboe, mm -hmm. um, early bassoon. Mm -hmm. Uh, Predecessor of the clarinet, for instance. Yes, early clarinet. Mm -hmm. um, and also more unusual instruments like the lute, like the harp, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the very early harp, which is smaller and has many more strings. Ah, as opposed to the concert harp with the pedals that right, we have. That's right, that's right. No pedals on, uh -huh, a, on an early harp. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> um, many s singers. Many singers. And how yeah. about percussion? Usually some Sometimes, yeah. Uh -huh. We actually, in our 11 years, we uh -huh. have not yet actually used very much percussion, but uh -huh. there is, there certainly was percussion. Uh 
Um, we tend to do more chamber music uh, rather than uh, large orchestral things, mm -hmm. um, although we are working up to larger and larger mm -hmm. concerts. Um, even when we do an orchestral concert, it's smaller than the RPO, for example. Uh, if we have 15 uh -huh. or 20 people, that's a lot. Uh -huh. Last year, we did the Monteverdi Vespers uh -huh. of 1610, right. and that had 25 people, and that was, that was huge for us. <laughs> well, now, um, that brings up a point about where you perform. and You need an intimate setting. Is this a region rich with such venues? Well, it's not like Europe. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. <laughs> in Europe, of course, there are many venues, and the wonderful thing about Europe is that this music was conceived there, mm -hmm. and when you play in a venue in Europe, it's very often the same age as the music you're playing, uh, yeah, I see. or older. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> um, but in this country, there are many beautiful churches oh, I see. Uh, to play in. Mm -hmm. um, now, not all our music is sacred, of course, oh, so uh -huh. sometimes, you know, there's a little disconnect, which I enjoy very uh -huh. much of being in a sacred space and doing very secular music. Mm -hmm. Some of this music is very secular. <laughs> um, there are some beautiful halls here yes, uh -huh. in Rochester, of course. Some uh -huh. of them are uh, difficult to get. Mm -hmm. um, so we're always looking for new and interesting venues. One of my favorite concerts that we did was um, in the old visual studies workshop. Yes, I'm familiar with And there were large sort of expressionist canvases oh. of pigs <laughs> up on the wall. And we did uh, Mozart uh, sonatas for piano, early piano and violin, oh right my. in front of these <laughs> expressionist pigs. And it was a really wonderful combination. It uh -huh. kind of just woke up our little brains, got uh, them moving uh, uh, um, to have that disconnect between what you saw and what you heard. Uh, so what is uh, a listener coming for the first time likely to encounter at Pegasus? What should they look forward to enjoying? Oh, uh, I think a real comfort level on the part of the performers. Uh -huh. um, it's not a sing-along, but we try to reach out to the audience. We uh, there's a, we enjoy each other. Uh, I only hire people that I like to play with. Uh, okay. Um, or who like each other. Uh, I see. And that makes for a very comfortable time on stage so that we can really enjoy the music and um, try new things. Uh -huh. So I like musicians who like to take an occasional risk uh -huh. so that maybe things come out in the concert not quite the way we rehearse them. Uh -huh. Um, but with a spontaneity within the style. Yeah. Um, and I think audiences enjoy that, and we try to sing out or play out to our audiences. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of the music that we play is not very well known oh, to most uh -huh. modern audiences. Uh -huh. There's a lot of obscure stuff. I see. There's very often things that maybe haven't been played since the 17th century. Uh -huh. Maybe I've pulled it out of Sibley Music Library oh, I see. for the first time in who knows how long. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time it's being heard by modern audiences. Another phenomenal local resource. That's right, mm -hmm. exactly. I couldn't do Pegasus Early Music without oh, Sibley interesting. Library. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so thank you, Sibley. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but they'll also hear some pieces that they might know and didn't know that, it was, that these pieces were uh -huh. very old. I always try to program something that might be a little familiar to some mm -hmm. people. For mm -hmm. example, on a concert of Renaissance music, you might hear um, a version of a tune that's known as Greensleeves. Oh, I see. Which, in fact, was a top hit Mm -hmm. A top 40 hit for probably 200 years. Um, <laughs> who knew? <laughs> and now it's a top hit again. Uh -huh, yeah. So there were many, many different versions that uh -huh. we have in manuscript or in early publications. I see. Um, and we might choose one of those to play. Find, so it, find it and bring it back to life. That's and right. New guys. Yeah. That's fantastic. So it's, um, you know, there always be surprises like that. Um, they will hear instruments that they know, such as the violin, but the instruments will sound a little bit different. Oh. 
um, because of the um, different technique and mm -hmm. the different bow, uh -huh. the different strings. Right. So um, now, is it a question of volume? Because the modern symphony orchestra plays quite loudly. Yes, the modern orchestra is very loud. Mm -hmm. It is partially a question of volume. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, um, well, for example, if there's a lute solo, yes, the lute is very quiet uh -huh. um, compared to the modern symphony orchestra. So it takes a little while for someone's ears to adjust. I see. Um, but I see. once they do adjust, it's like entering into a whole new sound world. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. then it sounds fine. It sounds I perfectly see. loud enough, uh -huh. but it's just a different way of listening. Well, and they're very colorful instruments, the ones you've mentioned so far. Very colorful, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that um, these older instruments have even more color than oh, some see. of the modern instruments, I think. Well, uh, For example, the piano, yeah. the old piano, uh -huh. um, has three very different ranges. The bass sounds very different. On a modern Steinway, you get kind of an even yes. sound all the way mm -hmm. up and Regulated, down. they call right. that. Yeah. That's right, that's mm right. -hmm. Well, the earlier pianos were not regulated, so you get a very rich, bassy uh -huh. sound in the bass, and then you get a real kind of alto sound in the middle, oh. um, and then the high is very sparkly. Oh, well, very so, characterful. Yes, yeah. And the very composers beautiful. might have had that in there. Absolutely. Ah, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did a concert. We had a group from Australia come mm -hmm. um, as special guests, and they did a concert of Brahms a couple of years my, ago. Oh my. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they used a piano. Actually, they used an original piano. Oh. From um, I think it was from about uh, the 1830s. Oh my! And Brahms was born in the 30s, yeah. so it would have been a piano that he could have played uh, on. Uh -huh. And the musicians were saying even that um, this taught them a lot about the music, hearing this piano and seeing what Brahms had written to uh, use that piano. Interesting. So, yeah. So the instruments teach us as uh -huh. well. Well, speaking of teaching, now, um, can a modern trained instrumentalist play these instruments, or is it a matter of learning new techniques and, and learning the instruments itself? Yes and yes. Yes and yes, OK. <laughs> um, of course, our musicians, modern trained musicians, they are very wonderful musicians and mm -hmm. have a lot of technique and very fine ears. Mm -hmm. um, so they can certainly pick up an instrument and play it. Um, Although, for example, for reed players, mm. I know that the reeds are very different on Baroque oboes and um, early bassoons as well, so they would have to adjust to mm -hmm. that. You're talking about the piece of wood at the top that yes, makes the sound. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. and, and these musicians actually make their own. They make their own, yeah. yes. Um, uh -huh. And modern bassoonists make their own make reeds, their own, too, uh -huh. and so do Baroque bassoonists, but it's a very different kind of uh -huh. piece of equipment. Um, but what's really important is to learn the style of the time. I see. Um, which is quite different from what we're uh -huh. um, told. Um, for example, there are uh, issues of ornamentation. Oh, certain yes. ornaments were used in certain countries at different times. Um, the improvisation style that was used. Um, even some of the phrasing. So it's important to uh, we can read about this. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, there are a mm -hmm. lot of people who've studied it and made wonderful recordings. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. So um, it's it's easy in some ways to pick up an instrument and play it, but mm -hmm. you really have to. It's like learning a new language. Right. Really. Right. And so, so are these uh, players local, or where are you finding people who have specialized in this? We use players from all over the world. Is that so? Um, and everybody has learned, has kind of made a decision to specialize in this kind of music. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. um, and there are some local, I like to say we use uh, musicians from the South Wedge to Australia. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, so Rochester is lucky. There are a lot of musicians uh -huh. here. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to use, I'm very lucky. I've had a long career and been able to travel a lot in the world to oh. play. So. Um, I feel like I have friends all over the world, and I uh -huh. like to have them come and play. Oh, so we're kind of a very, it's, you could call us an ensemble, but it's a very loose ensemble. Uh -huh. So we have guests who come from um, Australia uh -huh. or England or Italy to play, as well as from um, 
the South Wedge, mm -hmm. uh, from New York, mm -hmm. from California. And real experts in their art, in other yes, words. Yes, uh -huh. definitely experts uh -huh. in their art, and some of them very world-renowned. Uh, now, is there curatorial information at the concert, for instance, if I'm going and experiencing it for the first time? Do I learn while I'm there? Yes, you will. And because I think that the more you know about what you're going to hear, mm -hmm. um, the better you understand it, the more you enjoy it, and the more you're moved. I it. see. Uh huh. Um, so every concert has a pre-concert talk. Okay. Half hour pre-concert talk. Usually I give it. Uh huh. Um, and very often I'll bring in some of the musicians to show their instruments, to explain about oh, the instruments. Yes. Uh -huh. Um, we'll talk about the, uh, the context of the music, when was it written, uh, by whom, um, what was this composer doing at this point right. in his or her life, uh -huh. um, what was the, the context for the whole thing, was this court music, was this church music, was this mm -hmm. um, just uh, music for fun, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I'll show the, the original music which oh. looks very different from modern right, music. Right, sometimes right. it's in manuscript, sometimes right. it's in a very old print. It's yeah. very beautiful. Yeah. Um, we often play off of that music. Uh -huh. To me, it gives a much better idea of what the music um, sounds like than a modern edition where everything is spaced exactly evenly. Mm -hmm. If you look at um, Bach's handwriting, yes. for example, it's very expressive. He'll write a run of very fast notes, and you see the pen going shush. Ah, okay. And you don't get that same feeling in a modern edition where uh -huh. all the notes are evenly spaced. All right, and now people uh, record this music by computer, and it uh, comes that's out. Right, <laughs> that's right, that's <laughs> right. It comes out. So there's perfect. nothing like live music <laughs> to, oh, to understand how to play that whoosh. <laughs> so, um, so I talk about that in the uh -huh. pre-concert okay. talks. Very often we speak from the stage, oh, okay. tell uh -huh. a little something, yes. uh -huh. uh, a funny story about the music. Uh -huh. um, it's partly why I love doing research on this, on the programs and putting these pieces together because I just find so many great stories. Um, and then after the concert, we always have a reception, oh. and uh, all the musicians come, and people talk to us, and uh. that's always very fun for us as well as for uh, the audience. So a social element along yeah, with the Yeah, absolutely. With the uh -huh. yeah. Now, is it folk music or folk-derived? How would you, would you classify it? Well, a very long time ago, there wasn't quite so much difference between folk music and performed or classical music. Uh -huh. So, um, but at some point pieces were composed, they were written down. Mm -hmm. um, I've just been looking at some 14th century music and mm. I am amazed at how complex it is and how non-folky it is. You really had to be very well educated, uh -huh. first of all, to even read this music. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, Mm -hmm. This was in an age when most people were not even literate. Oh, yes. So um, to even count this music, is uh, some of it is beyond me. Mm, <laughs> sure. It's really very difficult. So, um, so I would say it's not folk music, although some of it, of course, is folk influence. Oh, I see. Um, and uh, maybe more than folk, I would say popular. Some ah, of it is popular music. We did a concert of music um, from 17th century England um, based on the diaries of Samuel Pepys. Oh. And a lot of that music was popular music of the day, uh -huh. music that people were hearing on the street. Ah, interesting. Um, and that maybe then was taken into court in an arra a special arrangement by a composer to play at court. Adopted by the higher classes. That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there was always this give and take between what was heard on the street and what was heard mm -hmm. in other venues, such as the court or the noble houses. And who was writing this music down if many of the people were unable to read? Well, um, at first it was the clerics, the uh -huh. monks. Okay of course, um, were the first people to actually figure out how to, how oh. to write down music. Mm -hmm. They could read, they mm -hmm. were well educated, they mm -hmm. came up with a system of notation. Uh -huh. um, and then in later centuries, um, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, there, um, as more people learned to read, more people would write it down. So, and, and musicians became educated and would write 
things down. Mm -hmm. Then uh, when publishing began in the 16th century, yeah. publishing was meant for the masses. Uh -huh. Let's put this book out so people can read it. Let's. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible, for instance. The Bible was one of the first mm -hmm. things. And, but music came very soon after. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. And so music was meant to sell, to be sold. So suddenly capitalism pops <laughs> into the musician's <laughs> life. <laughs> because, of course, musicians never make enough money. <laughs> um, so uh, composers mm -hmm. would write down their pieces. Oh, yeah. And at this time, composers were the same thing as musicians. Ah. Composers were the players. Uh -huh. Players were the composers. Uh -huh. um, they might improvise something and say, oh, that was good. I'll write it down. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I'll put it into a collection, oh, and it'll eventually get sold. So, um, and a lot of the music that we have, I think, started out as improvisation, oh. and then got written down either by the player mm -hmm. or by somebody who heard it. Oh. So oh. even in the time of Corelli, Corelli was a very famous violinist mm -hmm. and orchestra Baroque leader era. of the mm -hmm. Baroque era. Mm -hmm. um, somebody once sat in the back of the hall and wrote down the ornaments that Corelli wrote, or that Corelli played. Ah. And he was improvising, we think, uh -huh. on a very famous piece of music. And then this person published them. These are the ornaments that Corelli played. Oh, yeah. are we lucky? That's right, we are. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, who knows if he wrote it down correctly, but at least that's what he said. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So as artistic director, now you planned the season. Are you looking for a satisfying sequence of events, or how do you go about that, and how far advanced do you work? I work um, about a year or two in advance, mm. and putting together a whole season of five separate programs is one of the most fun and the most creative things that I do. Uh -huh. um, I think about music that I'm really interested in mm. or um, friends that I would love to bring to play a concert. Mm. You know, it's a little bit selfish, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, what can we give to Rochester? What hasn't been heard here for a long time? So. Um, Last year we did the Monteverdi Vespers yes. that hadn't been hadn't done, been done a, long, long time. a long time here. And to me, it's one of the most perfect pieces of music uh -huh. ever written. So it was time to do that. Um, and I had been wanting to do that for a long time, and last year was the year. So sometimes I have a list of, <laughs> of things. I look for a big variety of uh -huh. music, a variety of small concerts with maybe three or four or five people, mm -hmm. or bigger concerts with maybe up to 15 people. So mm -hmm. we mix that in. A variety of countries, um, mostly European, of course. That's where all this music comes from. <laughs> but French music, English music, Italian music, or perhaps themes. Uh, um, music by women composers. Uh, I see. Um, music uh, that... Um, came from Europe and ended up in South America, for example. Oh, I see. Or music um, on a literary uh, character, like Samuel Pepys. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. Or music from the court of the Sun King, Louis XIV. Mm -hmm. Or music, uh, you know, you can see it's pretty much anything mm -hmm. <laughs> that I get interested in. Uh -huh. uh, we can figure out a way to make it into a program. Uh -huh. And then, um, so a concert maybe of medieval music. Medieval, that's a long time. Yeah. So 12th, 13th, and 14th <laughs> yeah. into the 15th century. Uh -huh. So how are we going to decide what we play in that? Um, okay, let's narrow it down to French music. And so then we, you know, pick a little, choose a little, put it uh -huh. together, depending on um, our musicians who uh -huh. we have as well. Uh -huh. So. Or music featuring um, one of our favorite artists. For example, Elizabeth Walfish has been here several times. She's a very famous uh, violinist, I Baroque see. violinist mm -hmm. from England. Okay. Um, or Christian Bezadenhout, who's mm -hmm. a pianist um, who went to the Eastman School of Music and is very much beloved in this community. And we've been lucky to have him come back several times to play. Um, so. 
when it's Chris, I say, Chris, what do you want to play? Ah, <laughs> what shall we do? Ah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So, and, you know, he'll say, well, I'm into Mozart now. So, <laughs> ah, so the artist comes with their wish list. That's and right. And absolutely. Work around it's this. very collaborative. Ah. I always, um, I maybe, it's hard to know what I start with. Sometimes I start with an idea for a program. Sometimes I start with a person who I'd like to invite, uh -huh. to, a guest who uh -huh. I'd like to invite oh, yes. to come and play. Uh -huh. And then we work together. I say, what do you, what do you know? What do you like? What, what shall we do? Uh, yeah. So it all kind of, uh -huh. we get a big mass, a big list of things, <laughs> and eventually it sorts itself out. <laughs> <laughs> and if so. it's a holiday time and I'm looking for a wonderful concert to go to, is there something that you offer at the holiday season? Sometimes, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, there is a lot of holiday music around mm. here, so we usually do something um, <clears throat> in late November or December, and sometimes it has a theme, and sometimes it's just a great concert it's to go to. a great concert to. to go to. Sometimes so. a nice break from the other noise. That's, that's right, exactly. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> and how about <laughs> dance? Because a lot of the music is dance-inspired. A lot of the music is dance-inspired, particularly Baroque music. Mm. And um, we have done some concerts with dance, and it was, it's very fun to do Baroque dance mm. with Baroque music. The mm -hmm. costumes, the interaction between the musicians and the dancers, mm -hmm. the steps, which are very different. Um, it, it's sort of a whole pageant in a way. Um, and uh, although it's difficult to find a dance stage, at oh, the moment. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. the, the situation is changing, I'm happy In other words, the say. facilities. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and with dancers, you need the right kind of stage. That's right. So, um, dance and opera are mm -hmm. in our future <laughs> 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 um, as the venues uh -huh. uh, increase here. Yeah, that's right. And, um, but it's very fun to do um, m uh, music with dance. Um, I have to say, as a musician, as a player, I learn a lot about the music by watching, by working with a dancer uh -huh. and watching. Uh -huh. um, for example, in music, we have something called an upbeat and a downbeat. Yeah. The upbeat is usually the preparation for the next strong beat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes in dance, the upbeat, we call it an upbeat because it's light, but in dance, sometimes the upbeat is down. And then the body goes up on the downbeat. Uh -huh. and it, makes you play it in a very different way. Ah, it's a, a rebound in a way. Yes. Interesting. So, uh, as I said before, it's we're always learning and we're always reacting to each other ah. in that way, whether it's dancers or musicians. It's a very organic process. It is, uh -huh. and that's what I love about it. And uh -huh. I feel that the audience gets involved in uh -huh. that and, and can be very moved. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really feel that music can change lives, whether for a few minutes, if you get really caught up in something that's happening on stage, or for forever, because it, it can be very profound. And, and I like to think that as live musicians, we can bring that to people. That's wonderful. Now, mm -hmm. if we're looking to learn more about Pegasus early music and explore mm -hmm. this whole, how do you suggest people get in touch? Well, we have a website, oh. pegasusearlymusic.org, <laughs> and on the website are um, all of our concerts, past mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. future. Um, the next season is always there. You can buy tickets on the website. Mm -hmm. You can watch videos of us, mm -hmm. uh, listen to uh, recordings from our concerts, um, and there's also a contact form. Okay. And we have our brochures a lot of places around town. Let's hope many people find See you yes, there. Thank you. Deborah, thank, thank you. you so much for being my guest it's on been In My the Spotlight. Pleasure. So thank, thank you, you so very much. much. For coming in.